Well, good morning, Columbia Grove. We're so glad you decided to join us today. Whether you're in the room, hi Dick, whether you're in the room or you're behind that screen, we encourage you, if you're able, to stand as we open our worship service with a song that's all about what we believe as Christians.
heads with me. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together, Father, and worship. We know where two or more are gathered that you are here. So we just want to lift up your name, Father. We, wanna, we want to glorify you in all that we say and do. Help us to just commit this time to you now. And it's in the strong name of Jesus that we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you so much. Aren't they great? And yeah, give them a hand. Give the band a hand. It is so fun to see people, uh, people logging in from everywhere and see everybody here. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, we are one church that meets in multiple places. And so uh, let's be social. Let's do a, put a few greetings up. I want to especially greet uh, Patty Foster. Patty, we have been praying for you. We are glad to see that you are home. A home and on the mend. So... Um, yeah, so it's just fun to be able to see some of those things and see people signing in from all over the place, from Arizona, from British Columbia, from the great state of East Wenatchee, all over the place. It's just super cool, super cool. Well, um, a few things just to know about uh, coming in is we, are, we have some uh, new connection groups that are getting started. So um, if you're looking to take your next step of faith and kind of start to build your posse, uh, this can be a great place to do that. So if you're here in the building, you can see all the options on the back wall. Or if you're online, just go to columbiagrove.org, maybe a little bit later in the service, and just see all the options there. Just click your clicker onto uh, anything that looks good, and we will start to get you connected there um, with some fantastic leaders. Um, life is weird. It's a weird season, but we do not, we do not, do not need to go through it alone. So, um, so find places to connect. And I'm just going to turn it back over to the, uh, to the worship team. But as we do, I just want to lead us in a, in a time of prayer. And then um, actually invite us to, uh, especially if you're online, is to post an expression of trust. So this isn't just about kind of watching, you know, a worship service. This is about fully participating in the room. You know, be just be thinking about what it means to trust God with whatever you are facing today, whatever you have faced this week but post an expression of trust. Lord, as we remember your goodness together, uh, God, we, uh, we thank you that you are absolutely trustworthy. That just like in generations past, as our forefathers and foremothers have, they faced hardship of their own, pandemics of their own, times of uncertainty, and they found you faithful. Lord, may we rediscover in our own time and in our own way what it means to, to, to live lives of patient endurance, no matter what life throws at us, because we know that you're with us. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you in, in your name. Amen. All right, let's worship together. So whether you stand or whether you sit at home, whether you stand, whether you sit, uh, just whatever is going to be an expression of praise for you, an expression of trust, let's just, let's just worship the Lord together. And as we sing this next song, you know, if you came through those doors or if you're behind that screen and you are feeling so confident in our God that... You know, and there's peace in your heart, then praise him, amen. But if you have fears, doubts, worries, then I encourage you to just lay them at the foot of the cross today. Because it is my prayer for all of us that we will be able to sing this song with absolute confidence and be able to say without a doubt, it is well with my soul. But I know if I'm being completely honest with you today, church, there are areas in my life where that, the enemy is trying to steal away that joy. He's trying to steal that peace. He's bringing everything he can to try to take it away. But we're not gonna let him today. Let's join together today and let's just trust our Lord because our God, the God that we serve is still on the throne, church. He's still in control, amen? Worship with me today. Grander earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and 
So Lord, we place our trust in you. With Richard, we say we trust you, God, for your love. With Patty, we agree with that. With Debbie, we say we trust you, God, that your plan is the perfect plan. With Amelie, we uh, trust the strength you give, Jesus. With Marsha, to let go and let Jesus. With Jim, to say I truly trust that you are in control. With Charlie in Arizona, to say I, to trust in the Lord. God, thank you that you are absolutely trustworthy. Absolutely trustworthy. Lord, thank you that because of your work in our lives, we can say, regardless of what life throws at us, we can say, it is well with my soul. And so, Lord, as John uh, comes to lead us in other congregational prayers, uh, God, um, Lord, would you just enable us to be those, those people of trust, those people of trust? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please have a seat. And thanks, John, for leading us. We appreciate that. Good morning, Columbia Grove. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, our God, we come before you today seeking your presence and your guidance. We confess that our hearts are heavy because of what we see all around us, the strife, the growing number of homeless people, the large number of people who have lost their jobs, sickness, and far too many deaths. We long for the day when you will return and set your world right, when evil will be truly defeated and banished from your kingdom forever. Until that day comes, remind us that you still rule, that you do have a plan for each and every one of us, and that your love endures. Help us to remember that you bore the full wrath of God, all the horrors we have encountered in the book of Revelation while you were on the cross, so that we who call upon your name need not fear the wrath of God. You cried out, it is finished. Remind us of this good news, we pray. Help us to be prepared at all times for your royal banquet, and let us not be distracted by the cares and worries of this present life. Lord, we lift up your servants who are out on the road of life, actively looking to invite people into your banquet. Guide and protect them, we pray. Lead them to those who are seeking you or those who are seeking to truly understand the great truth about life. We pray that the coming banquet hall will be filled to overflowing with people from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. Be with our health care workers as they continue to battle this COVID pandemic. Be with authorities as they make decisions about reopening schools and businesses. Help us each to find the right balance of safety and connection. Lord, we particularly lift up those who have and continue to suffer from the isolation imposed by this pandemic. Help us to reach out to the lonely and hurting and to each other. Keep us connected, we pray. We lift up the family and friends of Dylan Cooper as they mourn his recent passing. Be with Penny Shea as she continues to recover from a brain aneurysm. Thank you for the progress that she has already made. Be with Bill as he continues to provide support for her. We lift up Patty Foster as she continues her recovery from COVID. We pray that she may regain full mobility and strength. Be with Don Pitts, a resident at Bonaventure 
who is struggling with pain in his legs. We lift up those struggling with chronic diseases, especially for those suffering from diseases where there is no effective therapy. Lord, the daily toll and suffering associated with these diseases can just wear on our souls. Bring comfort and relief, we pray. We long for the day when better therapies are available for these conditions. Be with those struggling with depression and other mental illnesses. We lift up those who are battling addictions or destructive habits. We lift up families that are struggling due to strife and turmoil. Teach us once again to forgive and love one another. Be with those on the margins of society. Open our eyes and our hearts to those in need, we pray. Be with Gayla as she prepares to leave her current ministry among us. Help her to reach her goal of completion of her degree. Continue to guide and bless her path, we pray. We lift up Andrew and his family. Lord, this last year has been long and arduous for him and for all those in full-time ministry. Affirm your call upon his life once again. Lift up your countenance on him and his family and give them peace. Open our hearts and minds to the message you have laid on Andrew's heart for today. And let us leave this time of worship once again reminded that you indeed are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. And all God's people say, Amen. John, thanks so much for, for leading. I, I just, love, just love hearing his heart. <laughs> now, today we are two weeks away from the completion of our series in the book of Revelation. So, we are getting to the good part, the really, really good part. And arguably today, we're going to be looking at what is the single most important moment in your existence. And... And I say that knowing that there are some incredibly important moments in life. Your wedding day, the birth of a child, the death of a loved one. And yet, this moment, this moment, is even more important than all of those. In fact, it's a moment so significant that pretty much every um, person from every faith on the planet, um, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, we'll talk about that. Uh, but believes in this moment. It's the, the, the moment of judgment that happen, happening sometime after we die. You know, the ancient Egyptians believed that our hearts would be weighed by Anubis, the god of the dead, against the weight of a feather. The uh, ancient Greeks believed that we would be judged by King Minos, um, a, um, I was going to... Uh, Akos, I'm gonna, I probably mispronounced that. If you're Greek, I am so sorry. Okay, and and um, and uh, Radamanthus, and depending on uh, how we lived, we would depend on there's kind of three levels of where people would go. In Hinduism, uh, after we die, uh, it's the belief that we are judged by Yama, the god of the dead, based on our karma. You've probably heard. Um, that term, karma, before in your life. When in Judaism or in Islam, it's an idea that we'll be judged by God according to our, to our deeds. And even in pop culture, we talk about uh, judgment. So whether that is, uh, you know, the deeply theological uh, show, uh, The Simpsons, you know, uh, you know the, there's recognition that one day we're going to stand before God. Or maybe you've seen the, the show The Good Place. You know, the idea that depending on your deeds, you're either going to go to the good place or the bad place. And it's a pretty cleverly written show. Um, but, you know, even in, in post-Christian America, we are still wrestling with these questions. It's still part of, of, of what we think about and talk about. Or, or, for, or for me, uh, growing up, um, you know, my, my deeply, like, theologically formative moments... Um, a lot of them happen Saturday morning with Saturday morning cartoons. Remember this, Tom and Jerry? And is Tom a good cat or a bad cat? Come on. 
He's a bad cat. He's a bad cat. He does hor- trying to do horrible things to that poor mouse. And so, you know, he dies. And then you see the golden, let's put that up on the screen again. You see that golden escalator and his and something spirit ghosty thing goes up. And then at least in, that parti- in, this, in this particular episode, then they end up in front of the, the heavenly train. Let's go to the next uh, slide for that. He, and, and, he's, and he realizes he needs to have a reservation in a book. There's that's a biblical reference of sorts, a twisted biblical reference that we're going to come back to. And he realizes he's not probably not in the book, so he's trying to sneak past. So we have we have this notion. I mean, every faith group pretty much has a even even and this is sort of ironic, even even the groups that kind of define their faith by their lack of belief in this moment end up being deeply shaped by this moment. So like uh, in uh, universalist. A universalist church, you know, which, which would be the idea that, yes, there's a moment of judgment, but everybody passes. Everybody gets to go to heaven. Doesn't matter what you've done. Everybody goes, in a certain degree, you know, that is, that is one of the pop culture elements of, um, even of, of, of America today. I mean, you go, to a, you go to almost any funeral anywhere, no matter who it was, no matter how they lived, and they just say, he's in a better place. Really? Are we, do we know that for certain? Honestly. Um, and, and of course, you know, the universalism to a certain degree kind of falls apart when you, uh, when, when you start asking questions like, so, so what do you do with people who are, have been truly evil? Truly, truly evil and they're unrepentant. I mean, so, I mean, I realize that's an extreme example, but so what do you do with Hitler and with Stalin, with Mao, who, you know, from the influence of their life, you know, two of them atheists, one of them Hitler, a pantheist, you know, the, the, those three people in the last 100 years have been personally, you know, connected to the death of conservatively more than 100 million people on the planet. Do they go to heaven? Well, that's where the, you know, the universalists end up having some trouble. <laughs> you, know, you know, they go, I don't know. I don't know if I, uh, what. But even in those faiths, they're, they're this, this issue of judgment and what makes life significant. And, and, and how, if there's a heaven, how do we get there? Ends up being incredibly important. And that's why uh, today, as we find ourselves in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, and I encourage you to have your Bibles open. Open them up, open them up. We're going to be looking at this issue. And because Jesus actually spoke quite a bit about uh, judgment. You know, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on that day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. John 12, 48. There's a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels before him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So, so it's this deeply embedded concept in, in Christianity, deeply embedded concept in every faith, although we're going to come to see today that there is, there is a one in very, very distinctive element of what it means to be a Christ follower when it comes to the day of judgment and what we believe. And so my, my, part of my prayer this morning is just that we would be able to lock in on this really key passage and understand it more deeply and just be filled with, honestly, with this gratitude for, um, for what the Bible really says about that great day. Now, um, in Revelation chapter 20, it's kind of ironic that, uh, that here's the, the, this chapter starts off with um, one of the, the, the ideas and the teachings around the return of Christ that is probably the least clear Biblically, the concept of the millennium, you know, this idea that um, after, um, as, as we've been journeying through the book of Revelation, as, as, uh, as uh, God removes his hand of protection from the world and evil in the world starts to rise and bubble to its surface and bubble to its first full effects. And so you have the dragon and the beasts and these world leaders and, and, and mankind itself actually rebels, like goes on full on war against God. And then as Jesus comes in, 
everything, all, of, all of it ends and Satan is bound. And then we find ourselves right here in this moment of the, of the millennium where Satan has been bound. And uh, it's kind of interesting because this earlier part, the, the concept of the, of the millennium, there aren't a lot of scriptural cross-references, and so there's a lot of debate on there. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, though I would encourage us, if you do have questions, um, we have a Facebook group that is just kind of designed for asking questions and, and debating ideas back and forth and, and stuff like that. Because I want to spend the bulk of our time today, not on the part in Revelation 20 that honestly is a little bit a little bit less clear, but the, the part at the very end that is absolutely crystal clear and is vitally important. So, um, so we find ourselves, you know, to the end of the millennium and uh, Satan has been bound and there's a thousand years. Uh, we have to assume that that's, that's a literal thousand years, though of course it could be a figurative thousand years where, where God is reigning, where the... Um, alongside those who have been martyred for the, from the, for the faith. So they are resurrected and they reign, rule and reign with him. Just a quick little side note. I was just thinking about how, um, you know, what an upgrade to earthly politics that is going to be. You know, if, if, the, if the actual criteria for getting into any form of, of uh, public leadership is you have to be not only willing, but you actually already have died for the kingdom. I mean, that's going to rule out every self-serving politician right there. So we're going to have a massive political up update. Yay for that. Um, <laughs> exactly. A lot of amens around there. I thought I'd get a rise from that one. Anyway, but uh, so, so we find ourselves, uh, you know, at the end of, end of this thousand years, presumably a literal thousand years, maybe a figurative thousand years. There's one kind of final opportunity for people to rebel against God and then Satan and... Um, and then Satan is, is completely bound and he is thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. And um, then we find ourselves in verse 11, the core of things, this great and glorious moment. So let's just read it uh, as, a, as, a, as a whole and then we're going to dive into the details. Then I saw, John writes, then I saw a great white throne and him who is seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened which is the book of life. If you've got your Bibles open, I want you to underline that sentence. It is absolutely key. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So let's start walking through this. Okay. So um, here's the first big idea. We find this in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Let's read the first half of it, okay? And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. So here's the first big idea. Everybody, everybody stands before God in judgment one day. Both great and small. So you, you, can't, you can't buy your way out of it. You know, you can't, you, you know, it's like sometimes human justice and thank God we live in, in probably the best human justice system ever devised. And yet we all know that it's imperfect. And sadly, uh, those with more money can often get better legal representation than those who don't have money. There's evidences of, at times even of like racial biases that get, get stuck into the system. But here at this moment, when we stand before God's throne, Everyone, everyone, everyone will stand before God in judgment. Every single person. Secondly, 
Judgment will happen by the books. That's what it says, right? I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. See, this is where the Bible is similar to every other faith in the world. You know, to some level or another. At the end of the earth as we know it, there will be justice. And judgment will happen by the books. There is nothing about it that will be arbitrary, nothing that will be unfair, nothing that's left out. Every fact will be, have already been presented before the courtroom, and now this is the moment of sentencing. Not a single unsupported claim, no fake news, no rumors, everything. Everything. But of course, we need to keep reading. Chapter 12, part B. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So everyone will be judged according to what they have done. And you get to, get to verse 13, it, it's almost like he's, in the vision, it's repeating the same idea. The, the sea will give up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades give up the dead that were in them, and every person will be judged according to what they had done. Everyone, everyone will be judged. It's almost as if in this vision, you know, John is making certain, or the, you know, the, as, as the vision is given to him, God is making certain through John that they, with, people are aware it's everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody that, that, that um, cause the sea gives up its dead. Cause you can imagine people asking, so what about, what about people who are lost at sea? What if they've never found the body? They'll be there. What about those who die on land? They'll be there. What about the Egyptians who believe they go to the place of the dead? Ah, uh, they'll be there. What about the Greeks? who believe when they die, they go to Hades. They'll be there. What about the atheists who don't believe in any of it? They'll be there. I can't believe I'm here. They'll be there. What about rich people? They'll be there. What about people who are so poor and their lives are so overlooked that nobody even is aware that they've died? They'll be there. Everyone, everyone, everyone will be there. What about those who, who die in fire or are cremated and their ashes are scattered everywhere? Well, they'll be there. We're, God made us in, in, the, in creation out of, out of the dust. He can do it again, even do it better the second time. Those who are lost at sea and they're bodies dissolved in the water. Anyway, 60% water, most of the ingredients are already there. They'll be there. Everyone, everyone, everyone will be there. And then verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This, this burning lake of sulfur, it's as hot and as stinky as you can imagine. And the lake of fire is the second death. This fire that burns forever. A place where the devil will be there forever. Because he's an immortal being. And one of the things that Christians have wondered about is, you know, for those who are cast into the lake of fire. Is that, is that a perpetual existence in that place? Maybe. Maybe not. Are they destroyed by that experience? Maybe. Maybe not. I've got my own opinions on that. And then verse 15, everyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, why, 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 why is everyone whose name's not in the book, why are they thrown into the book, lake of fire? What, what's the deal? It's because that is what justice demands. All of us, all of us will be judged by the book, by the books. 
that uh, every element of everything that we have done in life it tells us it's, it's recorded somewhere. So whether, whether that's like the Egyptians think of it as the weight of your heart with a feather or it's a, however the Greeks record it, or, but the, this concept of, of our, our, our actions in life by what we do is recorded somewhere. I don't know whether you, you, we each get our own book or you know, we, all, we all get a chapter in a great big book, but uh, everything is recorded. It's funny, the, uh, you know, what you, I've often wondered about, you know, what, why did God even allow Satan to exist? You know, why would God allow Satan to exist? It does seem at least one of the reasons why Satan was allowed to exist is because, I mean, you know, Satan, by, just by his very, both his name and his function, he's the accuser. He's the, he's the prosecuting attorney on steroids gone, gone wild, you know. That he, he is just there to make certain that the absolute, that absolutely nothing gets forgotten. Every accusation against every person that ever lived, nothing will be forgotten. It's all recorded in the book. It's there. Nothing will be left out. He'll exaggerate just in case, but nothing will be left out. That's why when you, when you, hear, when you hear that dragon in your ear, you know, you hear Satan whispering to you, he's always dragging back the past, you know, because he, he, he remembers it. He's recorded it. That's what he does. He's the accuser and nothing will be left out. So there'll be nobody ever that will be able to say on that moment that their judgment was arbitrary, that the evidence was incomplete. Nobody. The demands of justice will be fully and completely met. And all of us, every person, of every faith, of every belief, everyone will be judged by the books. And if we are judged by the books, by our actions, every person that ever lived will be found wanting, inadequate. That no one deserves the perfect paradise that God has prepared. Not a single person ever. There will be absolute justice in this universe. Everyone will be judged fairly and fully by the book. And every one of us will be found wanting. Every one of us. Except for one. The great news of the Bible, the great news of the gospel, is that just like you have a book, and I have a book, or at least a chapter in a book, and you know, my, my chapter's got some good days, or my book's got some good days. It's also got a lot of days that aren't. And me judged by my book, I dare say you judged by yours. We have no claim on, on, on the perfection of heaven. Not a one. All of us will be found inadequate, but, but there is one. We have a book. You have a book. Jesus has a book too. That in, throughout, in human history, there has been one person who when he is judged by the book, He is found to be perfect and worthy. And so the greatest question in our life <laughs> is not so much whether or not we will be judged by the book, but whose book will we be judged by? That's where that other book, remember the other book? Remember the one you underlined, all my Bible, my Bible scholars? There was another book. Another book was opened, which is the book 
of life. The Bible introduces this concept way back in Daniel chapter 12 as it's prophesying of the Messiah to come. And those, who's, those who are in the book will be rescued, says Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, right after the return of the 72. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, he says to his disciples, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Paul says the same kind of thing in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, as he writes, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Kem Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Jesus has a book. Jesus has a book. And he invites us to be a part of his book. So that we, when we stand before the Lord one day, and every single person will, regardless of what you believe, every single person will one day stand before God in judgment. And every person will be judged fully and fairly by what they have done. And Jesus invites us invites us to participate in his book. That his record of what he did in his life becomes the record by which we are judged. And that is good news. That is the greatest news ever. <laughs> Whose book? Whose book? Whose book? You know, even as Christians, sometimes we, you know, we, we, a couple of songs that just totally bug me, okay? If, if, you, if, if you ever have the temptation to play that Frank, Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way, at my funeral, I'll know I have completely, I've completely failed at life. Because the truth is, if I did it my way, I am to, to, to link Frank Sinatra and ACDC, I am truly on the highway to hell. That, is, that song is the, is the anthem of the lost. Because if I did it my way, if, if, if I was to stand before God on my record, my record is incomplete. But Jesus' record is absolutely perfect. And he invites us to align our lives with his. That what he did on the cross for us, but, but redeemed humanity and invites us into, into his righteousness. That his righteousness gets imputed to us. His, his record, if you will, gets pressed onto our lives. His book gets, we get included in his book. It's his righteousness that saves us. The Lamb's book of life. The Lamb's book of life. So whose book? Whose book? Whose book? And so here's, I want to invite you to do something just so we can spend a little bit of time with this. I hope I fed your head a little bit. I want us to spend some time with this concept on a heart level. Will you take out, a, if you, hopefully you received a piece of paper coming in. Did you get a piece of paper? And even you can, you, can, you can do this at home as well. You probably have a piece of paper somewhere. And if you didn't receive a piece of paper and you would like a piece of paper, put your hand up and, and, and one of our just awesome ushers will make certain that, you've, uh, that you get one. Because here's what I'd like to invite you to do. Just write your name on it. Just write your name. That we would rejoice that our names, 
But if you've given your heart to Christ, if you said, Jesus, I'm asking you to be my, my savior. Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me for what I've done in my life. I'm asking for you, for, to, to come under the umbrella of your righteousness. I'm placing my trust in you. In the moment that happened, however exactly that happened, whenever, however old you were, how, however many times you've struggled past that moment, in that moment, your name was written in his book. Look at it. So when you stand before the Lord one day, and our lives, and everything in our lives is, and the lives of everybody else is, every deed is evaluated. that when God looks on you because of what Jesus did for you and for me and for us, he sees your name in Jesus' book. So I wanted us to spend some time with that. That would fill your heart with gratitude. And maybe even as you're looking at, at that name there to, to be thinking about what other names and whose other names do you long to see there as well? And this might be a moment where you, you just write down the names because you're not going to have to share this with anybody. This is just between you and the Lord. This is just a prayer exercise. But the names of a few others that you pray, Lord, because of my life and because of what you do in my life and because of your love flowing through my life. Oh God, I want to see a few more names. <laughs> and maybe there's a name, another name or two or three or five that you'd want to write down. So as you're writing, you know, I invite you to look at your name and I invite us I invite us to pray. Would you bow your heads and bow your hearts and pray with me? Lord, thank you that because of Jesus, for all who trust in him, You grant the privilege of being included in your book of life. Lord, help us to not take lightly what you have done for us. Lord, help me to not take lightly what you have done for me. And I just invite you under your breath maybe to to lift up a, some, some sort of a prayer of gratitude and I invite you under your breath to pray for others that you, would, that you would pray would also come to know Christ in this way. Thank you, Lord, that on the day of judgment,
that my status before you will be fully determined by who Christ is and what, what Christ has done and not by what I've done. Lord, I trust in your righteousness alone. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. And so, Lord, fill me and fill us with that deep awareness of your love. Help us, Lord, to be so secure, so secure in your love that we are empowered to share it with the, with the people around us. Lord, may we truly love like Jesus because we know that we have been loved by Jesus this much, this much. Thank you that as we look forward to that day, we have, as believers, we have nothing to fear. So Lord, help us to live with holy boldness in a world that desperately needs to know your love, to know your truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And that takes us to the table. If you're at home, I invite you to take out some communion elements, from some bread, some juice from somewhere. If you're here in the room, you probably received a packet like this coming in through the door. I invite you to take this out. Because what, these, what this represents is incredibly powerful. The bread reminding us that Jesus gave his body. The juice reminding us that Jesus shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven, so that our status with God could be, what's the right way to put this? That our status would, with, with God would be perfect because of His perfect record. Because when, when, when God looks at us, He sees what Jesus has done for us, that we live as recipients of His righteousness. That's why on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, it is given for you. How in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. He is coming again. Amen? Amen. So Lord, we thank You for what these elements represent. Your, your body sacrificially given, Your blood sacrificially shed so that our sins could be forgiven, so our status with You could be restored, so that our names could be included in Your book of life. Lord, fill us with your life as we remember you and we remember what you have done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I invite you to serve one another. If you're at home, serve one another, one another however you like. If you're here in the building, we're not going to exchange elements, but I encourage you to look somebody in the eye. Look somebody in the eye and say, this is Christ's body given for you. This is Christ's blood given shed for you, that we remember who we are together as a community of faith because of what Jesus has done for us. Let's partake as we serve one another.
as we close as people of faith invite us if you're in the room to stand if you're at home invite you you can stand that'd be great but whatever you do I invite you however you do it to to, to speak these words out loud we're going to pray together the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray that we often call it the Lord's Prayer we were where we remember that we are citizens of his kingdom that we're looking forward to his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I cannot wait for next week when we get to talk about that further. So let's speak these words out loud. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Yes. Church, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking time to worship today. Uh, and uh, just a couple of announcements as we're heading out the door. We are a church that looks to make a difference in our community. So uh, we've been making cards for those in assisted living and those in the ICU. We're, we've delivered already more than 100 cards. We're getting ready. We're almost up to the second hundred number of cards out there. Uh, we've had people... Um, encouraging our medical workers with that sign. Uh, talk to Pastor Paul. Check out the sign. If you're here in the building, you can just take it home with you. And you can, you can, just, you can just start blessing, blessing medical workers everywhere or bless anybody else you like because we are a church that looks to love like Jesus. We love like Jesus because we've been filled with the love of Jesus. And so my prayer is as we go, that we go as people who are confident in the Lord, whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I, I should probably say this, just because I'm feeling like I left something out. If you're at home and, and uh, you're not certain where you are, you know, I told you to write your name down on a card, that could also be a form of your very first, a very first prayer of, of trust in Christ. Jesus, write my name in your book. It can change your eternity. And if, you, if you're taking a step like that, please let somebody know so we can celebrate that with you and just come alongside you and walk with you. It's the, it's the start of the best relationship ever, 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 ever. So, Lord, as we go from this place, help us to go as people of faith. Lord, help us to go filled with the love of Christ to a world that desperately needs to know it. May we go in your name, in your name, Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. I invite you also, if also whether you're at home or in the, in the room, to uh, spend a moment or two with a couple of the questions on the screen about, uh, you know, your thoughts on judgment, your thoughts on what it means to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God bless you.